John chapter 4 is where we left off, I believe. Let's continue here where we left off. I think it was chapter 4, verse 27. This is right in the middle of the story at the woman, uh, at the well with the woman who had five husbands that none were her husband. Five men, none were her husband. Jesus talked to her about true worship. And here the conversation's ending. Verse 27, at this point his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman, yet no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all the things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. He said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. So again, his disciples are on the natural playing field, which is very typical in Jesus' ministry because nobody was filled with the Spirit. A very few had revelation of anything. Every once in a while, someone would get this light to dawn in their heart, and they would say something profound. But for the most part, only Jesus had anything profound to say. Everybody else was still carnal, still natural. Even if they believed in God, believed in Jesus, they, they weren't renewed in spirit yet because Jesus had not yet died or risen from the grave in, in order to send us the Holy Spirit. So, again, his disciples are on the natural side, wondering what he's going to eat. He said, I have something to eat that you don't know of. Verse 33, Therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Now stop there for just a second. You could just kind of read through that, and it's like, oh, that's kind of weird. You know, he was Jesus, though. He said weird things. But I like to stop for a second and think, what does that mean? And what, how can I apply that to my life? He said, my food is to do the will of him to send me, him that sent me, and finish his work. Finish the work. What does food do for you? Nourishes you. Makes you feel good. Doesn't it? Sustains you. Helps you. Gives you strength. Gives you energy. Makes you healthy. Nourishes you. Isn't that right? What happens if you don't eat? Y'all get cranky. Y'all get mean, ornery, sad, depressed. Your lower jaw pops out. You don't feel good if you don't eat, right? Because you need food. Well, let's put it over on the spiritual side. If you don't do the will of God, you're going to feel bad. If you don't get in the will of God and do the work, you're not going to be a healthy Christian. You're not going to feel good on the inside. You're not going to be happy. You're not going to be healthy. You're not going to be strong. Okay? So realize that actually doing something in the will of God is essential for your, your well-being. We, we do all sorts of things uh, to make ourselves feel good. We go to work. We try to make more money. We try to have this. We try to have that. We try to get married. We try to do this. We try to get a new of this and a new of that and a new of this and a new of that and have some more fun. Trying to fulfill this need in us that feels content. And you know how that is. It never gets filled, does it? The only thing that can, can fill that void in you for contentment is God himself. And there's several things in God that you need to fill that void. It would be the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, prayer, and doing the will of God. And a few other things. We've talked about that many times. Um, just realize that if you want to live, you're going to have to do the will of God. And if you're not doing the will of God, you're not really living. You're just kind of going through the motions. And so if anybody's too busy to go to church, too busy to serve God, too busy to do the will of God, too busy to pray and find out the will of God, if anybody's like that, they're just hardly not even living at all. I mean, Jesus himself needed to do the will of God. It made him feel good. Fed him. Verse 35. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they're already white for harvest. So he's basically referring to the world and the need out there. It's already there. Sometimes we think, well, you know, uh, we, we, we procrastinate doing something for God. We procrastinate winning a soul or leading someone to Christ. Or thinking, you know, it's not time for a revival in the city. I want you to know I've been around the city in Christ for about 16 years now. And they, they're still saying the same old thing, praying the same old thing about the city. 
well, we're praying for revival. We're, we're expecting one day revival's coming. The, the wave of revival is going to come. The winds are blowing. The fires are blowing. The streams are running. The, all the stuff's are coming. And they've been praying and saying that stuff for years. And all that does is prolong every good thing. One day, signs and wonders. One day, God's going to come in the church. One day, an eye, a, a, a ear's going to pop open. Something good's going to happen one day. Well, I got news for you. It, it's been happening ever since I got in the kingdom. I've seen lots of things happening here and there ever since I got in. I didn't have to wait for something to come. And that falls right in line with Jesus. They were saying it back then. He's saying, don't say that. Don't start saying, well, one day when Messiah comes, he's come. Hallelujah. The fields are already white for harvest. Let's just go out there and get it. All we got to do is put some, sick, put some work to it. See, he's tying this to work. The field's already white for harvest. Just get your sick and go do something get it out and get it in here. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Skip down to verse 46. We'll skip some of this passage. He's again talking about uh, talking to the, to the Jews. Um, verse 46. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus came out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Let me just real quickly, each time we go through a miracle account, I'll try to pinpoint the keys in the miracle. Because there's always key ingredients for every miracle. Miracles don't just fall on us accidentally. Miracles don't just happen in the Bible because Jesus was there. They happen because specific ingredients were met or included. Number one, verse 47, he heard something. You've got to hear something before you can believe something. You've got to hear before you can believe and call upon Jesus. Or go to church and ask for somebody to pray for. You've got to hear something. <clears throat> Verse 48, Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. Now the word people is italicized. What does that mean? Any italicized word in the New Testament... <clears throat> Uh, means that the, uh, that word was not in the original text. It was added by the translators to help us understand and help us get a fuller meaning. Sometimes it helps a lot, sometimes a little, sometimes not much at all. Sometimes it might hinder us a little bit in a scripture. In this case, I think it's kind of a neutral one. Uh, he was probably addressing the people, not just the man. He said, unless you see signs and wonders, you'll by no means believe. Well, the nobleman already believed he had come. And he was pretty determined already. You'll see what he says in the, in, in the next moment. But he was basically, Jesus was saying, some of you people aren't ever going to believe unless you see signs and wonders. And he didn't have a, whole, a, a real problem with that, although he did tell Thomas that it's more blessed if you can believe without seeing. Remember that? Yeah. Thomas, Thomas said, you know, I'm not going to believe it's you unless I can stick my fingers in your side and your, in your hands and make sure. He said, okay, fine, go ahead and do it. But you'd be more blessed if you'd have believed it without having to see it. But Jesus realizes there's some hard-nosed people out there that just are determined they're not going to believe anything unless they can see it. Well, okay, he'll do a miracle. Or maybe they'll get to see a miracle. Now, if you, if you remember over in the, the book of Acts, Paul said the same thing. He said, uh, through mighty signs and wonders, I have fully preached the gospel in order to make the Gentiles obedient with word and deed. So one of the things this world needs is the word. Another thing this world needs is signs and wonders and miracles. The world needs that. We need that, don't we? The, seeing a miracle happen, whether it's just a, you know, just a, a minor thing that someone runs around the church happy about or a major thing, it, we need that. And, and God doesn't have a problem with that. He's always planned for this gospel to have signs and wonders accompany it. And so that's all Jesus is saying. Uh, unless you people see signs and wonders, you won't believe. The nobleman said, sir, come down before my child dies. Basically, we don't have time for you to be addressing the crowd right now. Just come with me. Jesus said to him, go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went his way. Notice that the nobleman was determined, wasn't he? He was determined. And so he even interrupted Jesus. Here Jesus is probably about to start a whole sermon. He says, well, well come, come, let's go. Come on, don't, don't, let's don't do any preaching right now. Let's get on home. Now, I'm, not, I'm just kind of guessing. I'm not saying that's doctrine. But I just want you to realize that there's some ingredients here. And if you have a, a need or a desire for God to do something, you just stay at it. I mean, you just get real sincere about it, expecting it fully. 
Don't ever approach God, or, or if you ever approach God and you ask something and it doesn't seem like there's an answer, and you start thinking, well, I wonder if he was going to do it or if he has no other plan for me or if he's got something else going. You know, I don't know what to do here. Well, why don't you just be a little more determined and say, okay, it's time to get I'm getting it right now, God. I'm receiving it from you right now. Get more determined rather than get more confused. Verse 50, Jesus said, go your way, your son lives, so the man believed. Then you're going to have to believe the word of God. Believe. You're going to have to believe the word of Jesus. So find some red words and believe them. For your case. For your case. For your situation. And really all the words in the whole Bible should be read. Did you know that? Every word in the whole Bible, Old and New Testament, should be read. It's all out of the mouth of God. Which is the word of God. Which is Jesus Christ himself. So it should all be read. Okay. And then it should all be read by you guys. <laughs> Verse 51, And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, Your son lives. And then he inquired of them about the hour when he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed in his whole household. Hallelujah. You know, if your whole house is going to get saved, they're going to all have to believe. Praise the Lord. Skip to chapter 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. And then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now that's exciting. Don't you wish we had one of those in Houston? Well, I don't think there's any more of these type things going on. There might be, but I doubt it. Uh, most of it's just superstition, hokey pokey stuff that never has any real results. And I don't really know how come God did this. People say, how come God did that back then? Well, I don't know. I don't know. It could have been the expectancy of the people. It could have been the dire need of the people. I don't know how it started or when God began to send an angel down. Um, <clears throat> but I do know this. And it kind of looks like almost the sovereignty of God. Which would be God doing something on his own without any human requirement. Because everything we see, everything else we see in the Bible, God needed a human to cooperate before he did anything. So it almost looks like, see, sometimes God just decides when to heal people. Well, I don't think you can apply that here in this, in this story. I think it's a little more detailed than that. I think that these people coming to the porch expecting causes God to move. Now, why did he do it with this, this odd thing with an angel touching the water? I don't know. I don't know, that's not really the New Testament pattern for miracles, but it's, it's how it was happening here. But I just want you to see the ingredients here for the miracle. The ingredients are people showed up to get something. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Notice that. Jesus saw the man... And asked him if he wanted to be made well. I kind of like the way it says it in the King James Version. Wilt thou be made whole? Rather than do you, wanna, do you want to be made well, will you be made well? Will you? So he kind of got to the heart. Maybe he said do you want to. I don't know exactly the right way to translate it in the Greek language. I think it's either way. And that's why the translations are different. You can say it either way in the Greek. In the Greek. So do you want to or will you be? Notice Jesus is addressing him now. Of course, the, I mean, the, the natural mind says, of course he wants to be made well. That's why he's come. Well, we don't know that for sure. So Jesus is going to get into his heart. And let's find out. Let's help the man. Praise the Lord. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water's stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Notice the sick man's response. What is it? Just his natural complaint. His natural obstacle. Isn't that right? So let me just put it over in modern day terms. What about you guys? What about me? What about us when we get sick? We know there's a place to get healed. We know that there's, you know, our God who can heal us and wants to heal us. We know that. At least some of us know that. So what do we do? We show up to God. And then what's he going to ask us? We don't know exactly what he's going to ask us. 
but we could at least cover this one just in case he's asking us this one. So next time you ever get sick or have an issue, uh, why don't you go and deal with this question just in case this is the one he's asking you. I can't promise you he's asking you that particularly, but it's a good start, isn't it? I, I've started here myself. I have a need, I approach God, and, and in the approach, it's like, oh, is it time to pray? Is it really going to happen? Should I, am I going to believe it? Am I really going to have any faith? And why don't you just address the question? Let's get with God and address the question that Jesus, what, that Jesus asked him and pretend like he asks us. Do you want to be made well? Or in the King James, wilt thou be made whole? Will you be made well? Here you've come, that's wonderful. Will you be made well now? Are you really going to believe that? Have you come expecting that? Or have you just come? Have you just showed up at the pool, not really expecting anything? Do you ha what excuse do you have? When he says, will you be made whole? Well, I don't know. Nobody put me in the water. I don't know. I, you know, I don't know. I hadn't been to church in a long time. I don't know. You know, I don't know if I got enough faith or not. You know, maybe something. I'm talking about determination, just like the nobleman, just determined. Will you be made whole? Yes, I will. And I'm staying till it's so. Definite, confident, no double-mindedness, no wavering. That's the kind of uh, ingredient needed for miracles, and that's what we see here. Or that's not what we see yet, but Jesus is going to fix it anyway. So don't fall into this, you know, excuse thing, this complaint thing, this natural reasoning well, you know, I was going to, I was going to, I thought, I thought maybe I could, but then I re remembered I didn't get prayed the last time I prayed, and I, so-and-so didn't get healed either last time they prayed, so I don't, I don't know, if you want to. You got to be more definite than that. You got to realize that God wants this, Jesus wants this. While I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. In this instant, Jesus, instance, Jesus just kind of overrides his doubts, his complainings, and his murmurings. Okay? Now, Jesus is in the place of God here, but he's also in the place of a minister. And you've heard me tell the story sometimes when people have come for prayer not having any faith. Matter of fact, the lady that told me, you know, she had a, she had a toothache. And she came for prayer. She said, I don't think I believe any of this, but you can go ahead and pray. And I said, you, you just want to get healed on my faith. And then when I said that, I knew for sure I could make that toothache go away. And I touched her chin like this and prayed for her. The power, I could feel the power touch her. And she said, I can't believe this. I just can't believe this. She started mashing herself. I, she walked off from the front. I just can't believe this. Can't believe this. I, I was at the back of the church as everybody was exiting after the meeting and I was shaking people's hands just saying bye she walked past me she said I still can't believe this <laughs> so that's the case here Jesus used his own faith and we've taught that before that sometimes you can get healed on the minister's faith well Jesus was acting as a minister here and so she, this man was healed because of Jesus faith sometimes Jesus just overrided their doubts and unbeliefs now if you're hearing this message don't, don't expect that it's your prayer time Okay, I have so many doubts, but just override them, Jesus. Don't do that. You're hearing enough to start believing in sincerity, okay? Um, but at the same time, realize that occasionally, Jesus will just appear in somebody's room and do something for them because somebody prayed a little half-hearted prayer. You know, you never really know. So I can't, I can't get in the, the, the whole, you know, orchestrated scenario of God's method, uh, but I do know the principles and the ingredients and the patterns in the Bible are for us, okay? So all we have to go on is these patterns, these holy, uh, spiritual, proven patterns in the Bible. And if you'll follow these, you'll get the same miracles. Jesus said, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. Now, that's what you need to do. You need to go to Jesus and answer the question. Pretend like he's asking you, do you want to be made well? Yes, I do. And then let the next command be, rise, take up your bed and walk. That's how simple it is. It's not a, a, it's not a, a tough you know, order of rigmarole that God expects from us to get well. You're never going to hear from God. Well, now, if you hadn't have cussed out Aunt Sally, and if you had not done this, and if you had read your scriptures like you were told 16 times, 
He's not going to do that to you. I guarantee that's never going to be what God tells you when you ask him things. When you go for a miracle. He's not going to get all convoluted and make it so rigorous and tough. What he's going to try to do is ask you enough questions or lead you into a couple scriptures that open your spirit up to receive a miracle. He's trying to get it more simplified for you to open up your thick skull just enough to get a miracle to squeeze through there. God realizes he's dealing with our soul. And our souls are all convoluted, aren't they? We don't need an, a list of convolution. We have an, a brain. And our brain is twisted up. It's got wires crossed. And all God wants to do for a miracle is just kind of short out one of them. Just kind of let's bypass. I don't know what the terminology is, but let's just clip one and bypass that dumb thing you were thinking and let's get a miracle for you. And so when God begins to minister to you, you approach him, he wants to start talking to you. He wants to command. He wants to say some things. He wants to ask you a question. And so we need to let him do that. And until you're in the, in the practice of hearing the voice of God, at least you could use some scripture. Why don't you go deal with these two sayings right here? Let him ask you this question, and then you answer him from your heart, and then let him command you what to do. And if you have some infirmity, rise, take up your bed, and go do something. Oh, you don't have to take up your bed. That was just because he was carrying his bed around. Like we say, nobody ever gets healed out of a wheelchair until you get up out of it. Amen? Amen? Some people get so tied to their infirmity that it becomes part of them. They don't know how to let go of it. And take some effort. Take some effort to get your soul to start thinking differently. To start seeing yourself standing upright or running or walking or talking or hearing or seeing or something like that. <clears throat> okay, so that day was the Sabbath. Verse 10, the Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. We could care less about the miracle and how wonderful that is. We just care about the bed carrying. No bed carrying on the Sabbath. You'd be surprised how many Christians even today, and I say Christians, because the religious folk will get mad at anything, you know, supernatural. And they'll just f forget all the good stuff that's happened to you and start, you know, poking at your <laughs> cult of a church or your wacky beliefs or whatever. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who's the man that said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn multitude being in that place. I do, I do want to make note of this, that the man that got healed did not have to believe anything about God. Did you know that? Now if somebody gets saved and someone's seeking the Lord, we explain God and have them trust God and teach them how to believe God for themselves. But at the same time, because you're a believer, and we've taught this in healing school, that people can come to you, regardless of all their religious beliefs. They come to you, you pray and get them healed. The man didn't believe anything, he didn't know anything. He didn't know the Messiah. He didn't know God. He just knew that Jesus was working miracles and he used his faith to get there. Many times that's all it takes. We don't have to get all super religious on people before they get healed. Now, it's not me that's going to heal you. It's going to be Jesus that heals you. You don't need to say all that to people. Let's get Jesus to heal and then you can explain it afterwards. <clears throat> At least that's one method. I guess the other method is you could try to talk them into believing Jesus. If they have any knowledge of Jesus, explain to them Jesus is the healer. Explain what Jesus did on the cross. You can do all that. So that would be another method. I didn't mean to throw out one to have another. We can have both. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you've been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Now some have stopped right there and said, See, sin is the reason you're sick. And begin to tell everybody that's sick that sin caused your sickness. It appears that it's possible. Now, Jesus didn't say sin caused it, but it's possible. We do know Jesus said, don't sin lest a worse thing come. Okay? Now, sin doesn't always cause sickness. In this case, maybe it did. Maybe, was, maybe Jesus was, you know, giving him some preliminary preparation for the future so he didn't get himself back into condemnation. That's what sin does to us. Sin puts us in condemnation in our own conscience we begin to feel guilty separating ourselves from God it's not God in heaven penalizing sin you send bam sickness you you quit sinning I take it away that's not God doing that 
The truth is, if sin caused your sickness, then repent and you should be instantly well. You with me? Sin is usually not the reason by itself. Sin will cause you to start feeling guilty, though, and that is a problem. When sin causes you to feel guilty and you begin to separate in your soul from God, feeling condemned, feeling less worthy, forgetting the blood of Jesus that brings you close to God, when you do that, then you're in trouble and in danger of the devil. And it's the condemnation of the devil that puts you under. The Bible says there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. You don't have to feel condemned, so either stop sinning or stay close to the blood of Jesus, or better yet, do both. There is proof over in the other, another uh, John 9, I believe, where the disciples came to Jesus and they said, here's a man born blind from birth who sinned, this man or his parents. See, so his disciples, Jesus' disciples even made that common mistake of thinking that all sin, I mean, all sickness is rooted in sin. So they wanted to know, did his parents sin or did he sin? Because he's got blindness. Jesus said neither. So that man's sickness had nothing to do with sin. So let's not get canned with it and the cornered uh, recognize that sin could cause it or maybe it didn't. There's a bunch of reasons for sickness to come. Okay. Verse 15, the man departed and told the Jews it was Jesus who made him well. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. So we don't mind you, Mr. Miracle Worker, but don't do it on the Sabbath. The devil can cause religious minds to just completely look ridiculous, just blinded, completely dark, bumping their nose on the, the, the door, whatever. Verse 17, but Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now and I've been working, therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him. Because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also he said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Why did they say that? What did that mean? Jesus didn't say it exactly like that. Or did he? When you call God your father, well, when Jesus called God his father, that put him on the same playing field with, his, with God Almighty. Right? I mean, my dad made me. I'm his son. And so when I was a little bitty baby, I didn't look like, I, I was just a little toddler, I didn't look like him at all. But now that I'm grown up, we're equal. In essence, in nature, we're equal. He still has a, a place in my life that's a notch above, but we're equal. Does that make sense? We're both men. We're both human. We're both of the same essence. We're equal. He created an equal. Isn't that right? I mean, arm wrestling, you know, maybe, I don't know. But God is your father as well. God is my father as well. Putting me on an equal playing field with God? Could it be? That's what, Je that's what they got mad at Jesus for. Was, was God Jesus' father? Is God your father? Are you saying that you're equal with God? In essence, yes. God created us in His likeness. In His image. We're made in the image of God. Sure, there's an order. Sure. But He made us like Him. And so, throughout the, the New Testament, what you see is God trying to lift man up where He belongs. Other people may hear this type of message and say, oh, you're trying to bring God down on our level. No, we're not. We're bringing us up to His. He's been trying that for years. Jesus tried that for years to, to bring. He's still trying to bring us all up to the image that we belong in. Uh, hold your place and turn to John 10. Don't take my word for it. Let's listen to Jesus. 
People think that Jesus was so far out there that it, it doesn't hardly apply to anybody, but it applies to everybody. What Jesus said applies directly to people. What the Holy Spirit ministered in the Bible is directly to me. Yeah. Ch uh, John 10, verse 34, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said you are... What? Look in your own Bible. You are what? God's. God's? If he called them God's, to whom the word of God came, talking about the Old Testament guy, and the strip, scripture cannot be broken. Do you say of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent to the world, you're blaspheming because I said I'm the Son of God? If you look over in the Old Testament, he called the people of God, gods. Little g, but nonetheless gods. Now God doesn't necessarily mean one that is worshipped. It means ruler. And that's the class we're in. We're not to be worshipped like God would, the Almighty, but we're in the same class of ruler as he. Little g, not big g, but yet we have a position that we have to rightfully step into or we'll grovel the rest of our lives. It's important that we don't have an image in our mind that we're unworthy, worthless, not valuable, no power. We're actually called to be kings, priests, princes with God. Hallelujah. Verse 19. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Now again, let's just look at Jesus as saying, I'm, I'm moved by God. The things I do are of him. He, he, he shows me, he leads me, he guides me. Uh, and then, again, it's the father-son relationship, which he's saying you can have the same thing. The father in you does the work. He can lead and guide and speak to you. You can live a life that is lived by what God wants. Verse 21, as the father raises the dead and gives life, life to them, even so the son gives life to whom he will. For the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the son. Notice this. God the Father, it says, judges no one. So when we talk about the judgment of God, how does it fit with this? The judgment of God would be a whole message, so I can't get into it. We're going to do it maybe on a Wednesday night coming forth. But the judgment of God is, is um, if you include this scripture, it kind of alters the judgment of God right now. He's committed all judgment to the Son. So Jesus actually has the gavel. That's good news for us. Because Jesus paid the price for human sin. Jesus understands us because he lived in our shoes. Hallelujah. Jesus is our judge. So the wrath of God is not for us. We'll read that in a minute. The wrath of God is not for us. The penalties of God from heaven are not for us. And they're not touching your life. You need to know that the judgment of God is not touching your life. It's a big deal to understand that. If you don't understand it, you'll start tying all bad things in your life to some sin or some neglect or your lifestyle or your uncertainties or you. <laughs> we all look in the mirror and think, Ugh, man, I got a lot of work to do. Well, except for you. I mean, you're doing pretty good. Verse 23, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Glory to God. So, do you believe in him who sent him? Do you believe the words and in him who sent him? Oh, then you have everlasting life and shall not come into judgment. I'll say it again. There is no whipping post for the Christian. Hallelujah. There is a judgment day. We will give account. We will talk face to face with our Lord. We may have to acknowledge some things, but there will be no whippings. Isn't that good news? 
You don't have to go hide the switch on Judgment Day. But has passed from death to life. We have already. Hath pa has passed. We've already passed from death to life. So just major on that. With faith, major on life rather than death. Major on what you do believe rather than what you don't. Major on what you do right rather than what you do wrong. Major on the goodness of God rather than the wrath of God. Major on all the blessings of the Lord rather than the curses of the Lord. Amen. Verse 25, Most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. We can apply that naturally uh, or figuratively. Figuratively, it would be anybody who's spiritually dead can hear the voice of God now. Jesus said the hour is coming now is, meaning, remember Jesus was planning for the cross. A lot of what he said was a, was a foretelling of the cross when after the cross the dead can now hear. And also after the cross, he went down and the dead did get to hear. The physically dead did get to hear. We'll read some more of that in a second. For as the Father has life in himself, even so he's granted the Son to have life in himself. And has given him authority to execute judgment also because he's the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. Hallelujah. Now he was speaking of when Jesus died on the cross, went down into the depths of the earth for three days, and preached to the spirits in prison, the Bible says. That's all he's referring to. And come forth those who've done good to the resurrection of life, those who've done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Now this, is, again, this is foretelling of what was going to happen uh, on year 33 AD when Jesus rose out of the grave, or when he went down into the depths of the earth. Then... The only people in the depths of the earth, well, everybody was in the depths of the earth. The only people that could go to heaven with Jesus were the righteous dead, those that had done good, those that had a covenant, those that tried to follow the law. Nobody could follow it, but they all tried. Those who tried to follow the law were good. Those who didn't were evil. The evil ones stayed in hell or went to hell to destruction. The good ones got to go with Jesus to heaven. Now the criteria is not good versus evil. So don't apply this to modern day. Amen. Jesus was talking about that moment when I go down, those good ones are going with me. Nowadays, it's different. The ones that go to heaven today must have received Jesus. <clears throat> I can of myself do nothing, as I hear I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Now, we'll skip a few verses here. Um, again, he was talking to the Jews, the Pharisees, and he got down even to verse 39. And he, he was just talking about how much they don't believe him. The Pharisees, the religious sect of the day, didn't believe him. He said, you search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. Let me just make a mention of this Scripture. Jesus was referring to the fact that the law of Moses and the prophets were valuable to the, to the Pharisees. Okay? The Pharisees, the Jews, the highest order of Jews, they've esteemed the law and all of the things that went with the law. All of their pomp and popularity, everything that they gained by being an influence in, the, in religion. And uh, so they thought that because they were the ones entrusted with the Torah, entrusted with the commands of God, the rabbis, the, the Pharisees, because they, they thought that was the answer for them. Jesus says, you think you have eternal life in those scriptures, but you don't. Those scriptures are here to testify of me. The scripture is to point us to the person. So when we see the printed page, you know, we don't put this on a pedestal and worship the Bible, right? And we don't neglect when we read the Bible that it's referring to the person of Christ. These words are spirit and life. So don't neglect that. Don't think it's just about quoting a scripture. Remember you've heard my testimony several times about me getting healed quoting a scripture? Or at least the first time quoting a scripture and quoting a scripture and quoting a scripture. Quoting a scripture didn't work, remember? Just quoting and quoting and quoting is not what's solved my ear infection. 
quoting and quoting and quoting didn't sol solve that. Remember what I did in the middle of that? I began to think of Jesus on the cross. I began to picture him. The scripture brought me to the person. It's important for us. God wants to be a person to you. He doesn't want to be a religion, a form, or a paper. And so the scripture points you to the person in spirit. And all of a sudden, you realize you have opened up your heart and received something supernatural from God. Whether it be healing or joy or salvation or anything you need in your soul for deliverance or happiness. Again, like I said, if you go back to chapter 5... Take a couple scriptures and, and, and major on them until it opens up your soul and you meet Jesus. Till it opens up your spiritual ear and you can hear Jesus. Hallelujah. Skip to verse uh, chapter 6 here. Let's go to chapter 6. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs which he performed on those who were diseased. Once again, they follow him because they saw the signs. Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that everyone may have a little. Again, on the natural level. Remember, all they could really do is, is answer on the natural level. Very seldom did the disciples ever, you know, have a revelation. A couple times, but very seldom. One of his disciples, Andrew Simons Peter's... Well, we'll stop there for a second. Let me make note of this. Notice it says, does it say it in your Bible, verse 6, this he said to test him? Yeah. To prove your Bible says to prove him. Here's King James. Yeah. King James says to prove him, same word, test, prove. It's the same Greek word, piera, same word used over in James, or at least similar to it. Uh, remember over in James, it says, let no one say when he's tested or tempted or proved that he's tested, tempted, or proved by God. For God does not, is never tested by evil, neither does he himself test anyone or tempt anyone with evil. So either God does or God doesn't, which is it? I mean, Jesus did act in the will of God. So if the Bible says God doesn't test anybody with evil, how do we correlate this and this scripture? Well, this wasn't evil. That's how. This wasn't evil. This was just a rhetorical question to Philip. This was just a trick question is all. That's not evil. That's just helping Philip see. And that's what God does to us. He'll ask us leading questions. He'll try to get us thinking right. He'll try to sneak into our brain a little bit. Cross some wires up, like I said. So this is the only form of testing Jesus or God will ever do to you. He's never going to give you a hardship to test you. He's never going to throw speed bumps in your pathway to hinder you and see if you're going to trust him, teach you a lesson, make you a better person. He's never going to do it that way. Amen. There's a whole bunch of obstacles in life that are going to come, but it's not, that, it's not God that sent them. You've got to realize that. Yep. But if he does test you, it's going to be with some words or some questions or some silence. He did that several times in the Bible. He just didn't say a word. What's he doing? He's testing you. He's seeing if you're going to come out. He's seeing if you're going to take a step of faith. He's seeing if you're really going to believe this or you're just kind of flippantly saying some things. So we have to allow God to be able to work with us and train us, but don't expect that evil things are the way that he does it. If we'll get trained properly, when evil things come, we'll handle them right. So verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew Simon, Peter's brother, said to him, There's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise the fish, as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, they eat too much. They're all gluttons. No, he didn't say that. Gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up, filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. 
Now, if you notice the spiritual principle here, you see, you see that seed time and harvest once again comes into play. Here they needed food for 5,000 men. Some say that means an average family of four. That would be 20,000 people. Maybe it could be 5,000 men in general, but some, most scholars believe it was 20,000 people. So five barley loaves and a few fishes. What was that needed for? Why did Jesus need that? I mean, that's what he took and gave thanks for it. Why did Jesus need those little... Why didn't he just snap some fingers and get all the, the lunch pails filled? Because for a miracle to happen, you need to have a seed. The seed's inside the... I mean, the miracle's inside the seed. If you don't ever plant a seed, you can't ever get a miracle. People want to pray and pray and pray and, and want something to come out of nothing. You can't just pray and pray and pray and expect something to come out of nothing. You're going to have to speak a word. You're going to have to give an offering. You're going to have to lay a hand. You're going to have to plant a seed. You're going to have to step out in faith in some manner before a miracle can come. This young lad gave all he had, planted the seed. All, all he needs is just one person to have a miracle. Planted a seed. Everybody ate. And then the lad got blessed. and it, it, More than double. And notice that the lad didn't, you know, give one little loaf of bread. I can't, I can't, here's one. I can spare one. And that's how people do even in giving offerings. It's like, well, I can give a little bit, I guess. It ain't much, you know. But I guess he can do a miracle. He did a miracle with a little there. No, you need to give something substantial to you. To break some of the stuff that we need over our head, we're going to have to do something substantial sometimes. You know, if, if all you do is give what's easy to give, you, you haven't really stretched yourself. And I'm not trying to pull mon more money out. I'm just saying you're going to have to follow ingredients in the Bible. This, this young fellow gave everything. Now, I don't want you to give everything. Please don't give everything all the time. Don't do that. That's not what the Bible's saying. But we're talking about substantial seed planting. Mrs. C. Nuzum, remember that name? She said that God's not going to answer prayer unless it costs you something. You're going to have, if you really want a salvation, you're going to have to want it. You're going to have to go for it. You want a prayer answered, you're really going to have to get a prayer answered. Remember that story of the, the fellow that came to his friend at midnight, banged on his door, wanted some food for a, a visitor that had come by? I mean, he didn't even come for himself. He just kept on and kept on and kept on and put his... Put his relationship out there. Put his pride out there. Kept knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking. Why? For somebody else. Cost him something. Cost him some friction with his neighbor. With his friend. Who knows what it cost him. But it took some effort, didn't it? Praise God. Verse 14. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said... This is truly the prophet who's come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Just wanted to point out that Jesus had to go pray by himself alone. Every time he did something big or every time he had a big day or a big crusade, next thing you know, he's off by himself, getting re refreshed, restored, resupplied. Every one of you need to do that. You're going to have to, you know, because everybody has tough days, everybody has a life, you're going to have to frequently go depart and get refreshed with God. Even Jesus had to do that. You're no better than Jesus, are you? Again, maybe. No, no. Not even, not even Allison. Not even Allison. Hallelujah. Where are we? Chapter 6. Are we still in 6? Let's see if we can cover a few more things in 6 here. Uh, go to verse 32. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Again, remember why I'm skipping a lot. I'm skipping a lot because you can read yourself. I'm not here to read the Bible all to you necessarily. You can read it for yourself. And uh, it's pretty self-explanatory some of the things I'm skipping. Either that or I just don't want to say anything about them. <clears throat> verse 32. Jesus said to them, If I don't know something, I'll just skip that one. No. I mean, that's how we preach. You know, I'm not going to preach something I don't know. So either it's easy or it's really difficult. One of the two. <laughs> some things you can take what the preacher says and, and, and some things the preacher doesn't say. You'll have to get it from the Holy Spirit by yourself if you really want to know. 
you can know pretty much everything, uh, but if there's some things you're going to put on the shelf and say, you know what, I just don't know about it. That's my unknown shelf. I'll just leave that there. And, ho- and, and I, it doesn't look like I, it's applicable for me or necessary, absolutely. I can leave it on the shelf for a while. All right? We'll get to it eventually, and if we don't, then you can ask Jesus when you get to heaven. Okay, verse 32. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Again, he's talking about himself. Jesus is speaking of himself as the bread that we need to eat. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that have... uh, said to you that you have seen me and yet you not, do not believe. All the Father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me I'll be by no means cast out. You can always use that with people. Tell them if they come to him God won't cast them out. Verse 38, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me. Hallelujah. If you want to know God's will, look at Jesus. If you have a question about something in life that went on, was it God's will? Well, go look at Jesus. Verse 39, this is the will of the Father who sent me that all of, that all of all he has given me I should lose nothing but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life and I'll raise him up at the last day. Again, that'd be your body. Your spirit would be gone immediately but he'll raise, maybe you're still around at the rapture on the last day and he'll raise you up. Verse 41, the Jews then complained about him because he said, I'm the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I've come down from heaven? Jesus answered and said, Don't murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I'll raise him up at the last day. Notice that principle, because we all have family, friends, relatives, co-workers, neighbors, strangers, all that, and we're trying to share Christ and trying to lead them, and some people don't come. Well, it's not time yet. If they don't follow you in, it's probably not time. No one can come unless God draws them. Now, that's not an exemption from trying to witness. Well, if God wanted them, he'd get them. One day he will. I don't don't have to be involved. No, we need to be involved and just realize that sometimes uh, God's going to have to draw them first. So pray that God will draw them. Pray that God will open their soul and just wait until he does. Skip down to verse 48. I'm the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which come down, comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I'm the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he'll live forever. And the bread that I give uh, is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. So that's why we receive communion together. We're partaking of the body of Jesus. Symbolically, we're partaking of his broken, sacrificed body so that we could live. We have to eat him in that manner. Now, that's kind of gross for some people. The truth is it's very spiritual, and it's, it's applied two ways. It's the symbolic reception of his death, his stripes that have healed a spirit, soul, and body. And it's also um, we feed on him via the Word of God. He is the Word of God, so we eat the Word. We feed on that bread which sustains us. Miracle manna from heaven which sustains us on a daily basis. Verse 30, uh, 53. Or verse 52. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and and, uh, I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. Again, you're going to have to stay close to Jesus. You're going to have to let him impart his life to you through his word. You're going to have to remember him in communion. You're going to have to actually take part of Christ. He take... He took part of you, you have to take part of him. Verse 58, this is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Glory to God. Uh, 
<clears throat> Verse 60, Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It's the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Now let me just mention this. The words spoken to you are spirit and life. And that's why I keep emphasizing we have to open our soul to this. Now some people in here, even in these messages, it's just kind of, it's, it's so much scripture, it's just kind of going right up. And that's okay. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. There's some people in here that are open and saying, feed me and tell me and teach me and train me and reorganize those wires in my brain. You with me? So I'm always saying, open your soul up to hear the truth. And if, and if you're honestly living for God, that's okay if you're a little closed and you can't hear some things for a while. But I encourage you to open your soul up eventually. Again, don't condemn yourself if you can't. But some of these things are fairly difficult. And reading a lot of scripture, sometimes it's fairly difficult for people. But you can do it. And so use your faith eventually to open up your soul and really get the things of God in. Where was I? 63, it's the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. So again, it's not your flesh that's having a hard time. It's your spirit just needs to open up. Put your flesh down. Verse 64, but there are some of you who don't believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that didn't believe and, he'd be, and who would betray him. And he said, therefore I've said to you, no one can come to me lest it's been granted to him by my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And then Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away too? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So here's a good question for everybody here. Okay, stop for just a second. There's a modern day attitude that we don't want to talk about the blood of Jesus because it's kind of gross. We don't want to talk about this, this chapter. They probably don't even preach this chapter. They've took, they've, many churches have taken the blood or songs about the blood out of their praise time because that's a little hard for the sinner to understand. But this is basic Christianity. Amen. And we can't take this out. And that's why I say major on the blood. It's a major thing that must be in our soul concerning Jesus. If you had been at the cross on Calvary when Jesus was crucified, you would have seen what? Lots of blood. If you were a, a, a Hebrew back in the days when the temple was still built, you would have seen lots of blood. If you were any Jew that lived from Moses until Jesus, you would understand blood in a real way. Because there was a lot of animal killing to sacrifice for sins. Matter of fact, in the temple, Solomon's temple, they had an elaborate. They had to kill upon the altar. Everything was killed upon the altar. All the bulls, goats, doves, sheep, oxen, everything was killed on the altar. And all that blood had to be drained. I mean, they had to drain every bit of blood out of the animals. And they had an elaborate plumbing system to drain the blood out of the temple and into the valleys. Aren't you glad you didn't have to live back then? My point is, if you did live back then, you would understand blood. You would understand how important this is, and it would mean something to you. If you had seen Jesus bleed, it would mean something to you. Since we didn't, he gave us communion so we could remember. But never underestimate the power of the blood of Jesus. When you get that in your soul, it'll, it'll, it'll stand you straight up. And it'll give you strength 